In the very heart of his novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, Philip K. Dick has Rick Deckard, the main character, entering into a fake police station that he is having presented to him as if it's not just a real police station, but as the real police station, the uh, Mission Street Hall of Justice, as opposed to his Lombard Street Hall of Justice, where he goes every morning at work and reports in and does his, his business. And so there's a, a lot going on here in chapters 10 and 11, even chapter 9, where the uh, lead up to this is happening. And there's two passages that we should start with when we're talking about this doppelgangering, not just of individuals, but of an entire police station. So first is at the beginning of chapter 10. The Mission Street Hall of Justice building, onto the roof of which the hover car descended, jutted up in a series of Baroque ornamented spires, complicated and modern. The handsome structure struck Rick Deckard as attractive, except for one aspect. He had never seen it before. And so he starts reflecting, right? Uh, it makes no sense, he said to himself. Who are these people? And if this place has always existed, why didn't we know about it? And why don't they know about us? Two parallel police agencies, he said to himself, ours and this one, but never coming into contact, as far as I know, until now. Or maybe they have, he thought. Maybe this isn't the first time. Hard to believe, he thought, that this wouldn't have happened long ago. If it really is a police apparatus here, if that's what it asserts itself to be. And then we find that Inspector Garland, uh, the person in charge of that office, is going to say, as he brings in Phil Resch, another bounty hunter, says, I don't think you understand the situation. This man, or android, Rick Deckard, comes to us from a phantom, hallucinatory, non-existent police agency, allegedly operating out of the old departmental headquarters on Lombard. He's never heard of us, and we've never heard of him. He employs a test we've never heard of. The list he carries around isn't of androids. It's a list of human beings. He's already killed once, at least once. And if Miss Luft hadn't gotten to a phone, he probably would have killed her. And then eventually he would have come sniffing around after me. So the question here is like, well, who's the android? Whose memories can actually be relied upon? Who has the truthful perception, understanding, experience within the world, and who's, who's the real cop, right? So this is a serious issue. Now, I should point out that none of this happens within the film adaptation, The Blade Runner, right? This is completely left out. And what ends up happening in chapter nine is that Descartes is trying to administer the Voigtkampf empathy test to the opera singer android Luba Luft to prove that she's an android. This is after he's already killed another android who's in his car. And so he's trying to fulfill his bounties. And she finds ways to subvert the test. You know, she pretends like she doesn't understand English very well and uses that linguistic barrier and then her own uh, incomprehension and curiosity about the test to try to keep him from being able to administer it. And then as he begins to, to do so, she pulls out a laser tube, points it at him and calls the cops. Now, Deckard is happy to have the cops called. He's like, yeah, they'll verify for you that I'm actually a bounty hunter, that I'm doing my legitimate duty here, and that everything is on the proverbial up and up. So what, what ends up happening is this, this cop, a harness bull, or as we would say, a beat cop, right, shows up, Officer Crams. And Officer Crams is kind of a no-nonsense fellow. He wants to know what's going on here and you know, take uh, statements from, from both. And when Deckard says, listen, I'm, I'm a fellow policeman. Let me get my inspector on the phone and you can talk to him. He's able to call and he's able to get Bryant on the phone 
And then when he hands the phone off to Officer Krams, the video screen is blank, and Krams says, there's nobody on this line. I don't know what's going on, but buddy, I'm taking you in. And so uh, Deckard is like, yeah, let's, let's go to the uh, police office, and we'll get this all straightened out, and uh, this will be, you know, this will be good. We'll, we'll finish this up. And then um, they get in the patrol car and start heading south. And he says, something was not as it should be. Officer Krams had steered the car in the wrong direction. The Hall of Justice, Rick said, is north on Lombard. That's the old Hall of Justice, Officer Cram said. The new one is on mission. That old building, it's disintegrating. It's, ru- it's a ruin. Nobody's used it for years. Has it been that long since you last got booked? And Rick says, take me there to Lombard Street. He understood it all now, saw what the androids working together had achieved. He would not live beyond this ride. For him, it was the end. And so he's, he's already like suspicious of these people, uh, androids, right? He knows that there's something going on. And then he arrives at the beginning of chapter 12, gets booked, and Inspector Garland takes him aside, and they have a couple different uh, conversations. So the first thing is, uh, he says, what do you have in, in this briefcase, Mr. Deckard? And Rick says, material pertaining to the voight Camp personality test. I was testing a suspect when Officer Cram's arrested me. The questions I asked Miss Loft are standard VK questions. And then uh, Garland says, do you know George Gleason and Phil Rush? And Rick says, no. And then he says, well, they're the bounty hunters for Northern California. Both are attached to our department. Maybe you'll run into them while you're here. And Rick tries calling his wife, uh, reaches a woman he's never seen before. Um, and then uh, de- the, um, the, the Inspector Garland is going to say, here's your briefcase. I'd like to talk with you further. Come on into my office. What's this test that you're using? And they go back and forth talking about uh, the different tests that they use. And then he says, um, look, I'm, I'm checking out your assignments here. It looks like I'm on your list. This is rather disconcerting. Um, And he says, I'm going to get Phil Rush. Let's bring him into this. And so then they they start having a further conversation about matters. And so Garland himself is listed as one of the androids. Now, something very interesting is going to happen with the androids in their conversations with Deckard, and also to a certain extent uh, in relation to Phil Resch as well, the other bounty hunter. So Loba Luft, Officer Krams, and Inspector Garland are each going to suggest to Deckard that he is actually an android. And the shortest one is the harness bull, right, who... um, says, maybe you're an android with false memories like they give them. Had he ever thought of that? He grinned frigidly as he continued to drive south. And this is after Deckard says, listen, buddy, you're an android. (laughs) Uh, And this is going to be a lot of big trouble here, right? So he's he's just kind of like following through on stuff. Garland is going to suggest something different. He says... Are you an android, Mr. Deckard? The reason I ask is that several times in the past we've had escaped Andes turn up posing as out-of-state bounty hunters here in pursuit of a suspect. So he's giving him something a bit more plausible, a bit more particular. You could have false memories, Deckard, and think that you're actually a bounty hunter when you're not. Now, Luba Luft is the one who's actually got the most sophisticated pitch for him. And um, it arises first with a discussion about androids and their relation to each other. So she says, I'm not an android. Um, Do you have information there's an android in the cast? I'd be glad to help you. And if I were an android, would I be glad to help you? And Deckard says, 
An android doesn't care what happens to another android. That's one of the indications we look for. And then she says something really startling. Well, then you must be an android. That stopped him. He stared at her. Because, she continued, your job is to kill them, isn't it? You're what they call a bounty hunter, Rick said, but I'm not an android. And then she brings in another consideration. This test you want to give me, have you taken it? And he says, yes, a long, long time ago when I first started with the department. Maybe that's a false memory. Don't androids sometimes go around with false memories? And Rick says, my superiors know about the test. It's mandatory. And then she says, maybe there was once a human who looked like you and somewhere along the line, you killed him and took his place. And your superiors don't know. She also suggests, I'll take the test after you take the test. And he says, listen, lady, you, you can't give the test, so we're going to get on with this. And that's when she you know, pulls the laser tube and the harness bowl shows up and all that. So each of them are suggesting that Deckard himself is not just a hunter of androids, but an android himself. So there's something kind of contradictory about this. He's mixed up. And this is a way for them, the androids, to try to trip up the human being. And now we should talk about Phil Resch because he emerges in chapter 10, right? He's one of the other bounty hunters. And Garland uh, calls Phil Resch to come in and he introduces them. He says, you're both bounty hunters and it's probably time you met. And uh, Resch says, which city are you attached to? Garland answered for Rick San Francisco. Take a look at his schedule. This one comes up next. And then Rush says, Sagar, this, this is you. And he says, there's more. He's also got Lobo Luft, the opera singer there, on his list of, retire list of retirement assignments. And Polakoff, remember Polakoff? He's now dead. This bounty hunter or android or whatever he is got him, and we're running a bone marrow test at the lab to see if there's any conceivable basis. Now, here's where Phil Rush says something interesting. It says, Polakoff I've talked to, that big Santa Claus from the Soviet police, I think it is a good idea to run a bone marrow test on him. And Garland says, why? It's just to remove any legal basis on which this man Deckard could claim he hasn't killed anyone. He'd only retired an android. And Resch says, Polakoff struck me as cold, extremely cerebral and calculating detached. And Garland says, well, a lot of the Soviet cops are that way. And uh, Resch continues on and says, you know, ever since I first met Polakoff, I wanted to test him, but no pretext ever arose. It never would have either, which is one of the values such a spot would have for an enterprising android. Now, what kind of spot? He, a little bit earlier, he says, um, I've always said the best place for an android would be with a big police organization, right? Well, why? Because they would be you could say, the, the administers of the test rather than the administered. And they're the ones who have the monopoly on force. So, you know, it would make sense that an android would want to infiltrate. And this is where Garland says, I don't think you understand the situation. And um, uh, Phil Resch, you know, says, well, Garland says, have you wanted to test me too? A discreet smile traveled across Phil Resch's face. He started to answer and then shrugged. He did not seem afraid of his superior, despite Garland's palpable wrath, right? And, um, you know, he's going to leave and go and get his own test to administer to uh, Inspector Garland, the Bonelli reflex arc test. And he says, I've said for years, it should be applied routinely to police personnel. The higher up the chain of command, the better. And Garland says, yeah, I've always opposed that on the basis of, you know, bad for morale. And then uh, Rick says, well, I think you're going to have to sit still for it because po Polakoff turns out to be an android. And so then, um, you know, we, we get into this interesting conversation after Phil Rush leaves and Garland says, man, this is going to be a mind blower. Okay, I'm, I'm an android. Got, you got me there. But Resch doesn't know he's also an android. So exactly what they've been suggesting 
is the case for Descartes, which isn't the case for Descartes at all. By the way, as a side note, a lot of write-ups of the difference between the film The Blade Runner and the novel the Android's Dream of Electric Sheep say, well, the novel hints that Descartes himself might be an android. No, it's androids that hint that Descartes might be an android, actually don't hint at it, suggest it strongly, and the novel rejects that entirely, right? And it's also going to reject Phil Resch himself being an android, although Garland is claiming that Resch is an android, and they're trying to put that sort of suspicion into both of their heads about Resch. Now, when Resch comes down... Garland tries to shoot him. Resch shoots him instead. They've killed the android. And now the question is, what next? What are we going to do? And um, there's really several things that are coming up here. So um, they've realized that the building is as, you know, android infested. And they're going to sneak out, was what they do. But Resch has a moment of, you could call it clarity, but also something like horror. He says, um, I can't get over it. It doesn't seem possible. For three years, I've been working under the direction of androids. Why didn't I suspect? I mean, enough to do something. And then... Um, Descartes says, well, maybe it's not that long. Uh, they, maybe they only recently infiltrated this building, right? Because Garland hasn't been around that long. And then Resch says, or yeah, he, here he goes. He says, they've been here all the time. Garland has been my superior from the start throughout my three years. And then Rick says, according to it, the bunch of them came to Earth together, and that wasn't as long as three years. It's only been a matter of months. And then Phil says this. Then at one time an authentic Garland existed and somewhere along the way got replaced. His shark-like lean face twisted as he struggled to understand. Or, here, so he's got a dilemma, I've been impregnated with a false memory system. Maybe I only remember Garland over the whole time, but only androids show up with false memory systems. It's been found ineffective in human beings. So Phil Resch either has been working at a fake police station, not knowing that there was another police station. And this fake police station, by the way, Garland tells them, uh, he says, this is a homeostatic enterprise we're operating here, Deckard. We're a closed loop cut off from the rest of San Francisco. We know about them, but they don't know about us. Sometimes an isolated person such as yourself wanders in here or, as in your case, is brought here for our protection. Now, how is it that smart Phil Resch hasn't noticed that? The alternative is he's actually an android. And he's had false memories implanted. And an android just killed another android and is going to come along and help kill yet another android. And this is very problematic, isn't it? Now, they, they do manage to escape the Mission Street Hall of Justice um, you know, by pretending that Descartes is a prisoner, by propping up Garland at his desk, by tapping the intercom and saying, Inspector Garland is not to be bothered for the next hour. So they managed to get out of the Mission Street Hall of Justice, but it still leaves a lot of questions open, both for the characters who raise those questions, is Phil Resch an android or not? But also for the rest of us, us readers, there's larger open questions. How is a place like this able to manage? What, what about these time discrepancies that we're noticing? And, and Dick never does end up clarifying those matters.